I'm Toya Nash Randall, curator and catalyst of the multimedia narrative platform Voice Vision Value. This month marks the third anniversary of Voice Vision Value, and I'm excited to announce my newest partnership with nationally respected philanthropist, community leader, and entrepreneur Shonda Smith Baker. Sponsored by Voice Vision Value, Centering Conversations is a new exclusive segment of the award winning podcast Conversations with Shonda. We're releasing new episodes every Wednesday during Black Philanthropy Month. Be sure to check out the full suite of Centering Conversation interviews this month, where Shonda talks to Angel Robertson Daniel, Tashawn Macon, Kiana Thomason, and Coneal Mack. Beginning in September, Centering Conversations will drop every third Wednesday of the month. If you want to know more about Voice Vision Value, check us out at voicevisionvalue.org, where you can also read the Twin Cities chapter of the forthcoming book, Portraits of Us. To Sean Macon, I am so pleased to have you on what is a new and what I think is an honorable relationship and partnership to be in with Toya Nash Randall and Voice Vision Value called Centering Conversations. You have been part of the arc of how this has uh, evolved and been created, and you were in with us when we had the conversation and came up with the name. So I welcome you today into this conversation with me. Thank you so very much for having me today. I am indeed honored. I'm humbled. I'm blessed to be in such great company uh, with you, Shonda your imagination, your ingenuity, your leadership, uh, Toya's imagination, ingenuity, fierceness and fearlessness. I'm like, I'm in a company of some rock star women. So <laughs> I'm happy to be here today. Thank you for having me. You know, we came into community because Toya is such a community builder. She has created space for black women to dream bigger to connect their dreams together and to reimagine what's possible if the barriers that we have to navigate didn't exist. And she invited you in to support our community. What did you discover when you got there? I discovered this beautiful, powerful energy that was spirit showing up in the personhood of Black women that was grappling with being stifled by societal conditions and also seeking solutions to overcome them. I was humbled by the brilliance in the room. Um, and so often, you know, in my background coming from pop culture, we often recognize or identify or relegate stardom to the stage. And I have been privileged and honored to be able to, to see that aspect, but also to recognize it in the soul and spirit of beings. And mm -hmm. so I walked into the room and I felt this... Um, this huge presence of stardom of the soul, stardom of the spirit, um, this commitment to live out purpose in a platform that happened to be philanthropy, right? Um, and it moved me and I communicated it. I, I, I said to the cohort I was privileged to be in community with, I was like, wow, how are you even holding all of this magic? Hmm. Let alone distributing and communicating this magic. And what happens when forces and sources seek to devalue this magic? How are you replenishing it? And why don't, why doesn't the world know about you? That was my entry. I was like, everybody should know about you. Right? I think you remember that. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I literally minute. remember it. Yeah, I do. And I, I discovered that there was this energy of safety. Like, mm. 
I'm not safe to be my sacred self. I'm not safe in these spaces to be my most brilliant self. There is risk to my family. There's risk to my finances. There's risk when I show up as the force spirit made me to be. And that's when I was like, oh, wait a minute. We got to do something about that. You know what I mean? So that's kind of how I felt. I have encountered through that experience and many conversations, the distance between how people may see me and how I might experience myself or how, how Black women in particular may see themselves and how I experience them. And I think there is a conditioning and part of your work is to uncover what they need to see? Is that how you would, like, how would you describe the journeys that you have helped people? Because it's easy to talk about it as brand, but it's so much more to be able to even articulate the words to describe who you are. Yes. I think if I explained it, I would say, I am in partnership, community, and connection to unearth your sacred self. Mm. And in unearthing your sacred self and in a person discovering their sacred self, coming alongside in partnership, strengthening, supporting, and seizing that moment so that you're comfortable standing in your sacred self. And then trusting that all of the possibilities available to you will come to you. That I do fundamentally believe that as in partnership with a person, as we embrace the sacred self, the resources and the supply must show up because it is what you were divinely born to be, Mm -hmm. right? But I do think that there is a, a cultural narrative with the best intentions, honestly, the cultural narrative that we inherited with the best intentions were to be twice as good to get half as far. Can we talk more about that? Because (laughs) I have been sort of in this place over the last couple of years of thinking about all of those sayings and ways in which we have been conditioned. Some of those ways have been societal and some of those have been cultural of, you know, you gotta, you know, the black tax, you gotta work twice as hard. The, the Black woman as the worker, like I can't take a day off because I've got, like you're just carrying so much as though it is a role that we have to play without sharing it. Mm-hmm. What, are, what are some of those things from your perspective that we need to examine in the way that we're moving through? Absolutely. I think a couple of those things that are critically important from a cultural context that we examine is education as the great equalizer. That's a myth. Um, we can unpack that further. Um, the, uh, the fact that women of color, particularly black and brown women are the pack mule of society, that we are the mule of our communities, our families, um, that we do not have the luxury of laying down and that laying down is even a luxury (laughs) unto Mm -hmm. itself. Like how did that become a premium experience? Something as simple as sleep and rest that with the best intentions, and I think it's extremely important that I contextualize that I acknowledge that the intention of our ancestors culturally was to give us drive when we were told you have to be twice as good to get half as far. Their intention was drive. Mm -hmm. On the spiritual context though, that's a deficit mentality. And the deficit mentality or the deficit philosophy let me say that let me clear that up the deficit philosophy then actually disrupts your destiny because your soul i gotta be twice as good 
to get half as far, but that is not a destiny equation. That is not spiritually true. So if I lock into this deficit philosophy or this deficit psychology, then what happens is that I really, I have such a conscious block ar around living in my destiny because I'm concerned about the cost, black tax. Tax is a cost. I'm so connected and, and concerned about the cost and the conditions I'm paralyzed to live out my purpose. I will live out my profession and my vocation. Purpose, maybe not so much. That's what I've experienced as I've been doing this work. And how would you define purpose? Purpose is who you are being, even when you are not trying to be it. So purpose is not what you're doing. It's your being. It's your being. Mm -hmm. It's your beingness, right? It's not your doing. It's your being, right? And so you can be that in any vertical of business. You can be that in any element of culture. It is your being. Who you are born to be, you will be it anywhere you were placed. And so the distinction with destiny is that when I make an agreement with destiny, and this goes into like storytelling. I mean, there's all these fantastic names that have come about Chanda and I get them, I respect them, I appreciate them. When you get down to the heart of them, it's really this embrace of the essence of why I was born. <laughs> Am I willing to amplify, live into and elevate the reason I'm born? And how do I then say, in my beingness, what am I being every day that is almost not simply effortless, but effective? That shows up in motherhood. It shows up in medicine. It shows up in marketing. It shows up in finances. So it's not so much the job as much as it is what I call the joints, how God knitted you together. Come on now. <laughs> how he knitted you together, right? So it's not just the, the, the job, it's the joy and the joints. It's like, and I, you know, listen, my great grandmother had a juke joint. So oftentimes I think about how talent, they couldn't do anything but play, even if it meant it was a juke joint on the Jim Crow circuit. They would rather take 10 cents to do it than a dollar not to do it. And then they kept on taking those 10 cents to do it until that 10 cent turned into a dollar, that dollar turned into 10, that 10 turned into a million, right? Because there was no way they couldn't be who they were born to be. It wasn't a negotiation they were willing to make. And I think we live in a period in time that that particularly black women, and I, I, I wanna be transparent and honest here with your audience. It's very difficult to be the most educated woman in society and be the least paid and consciously educationally know that and that not have an impact on your cellular structure. That's trauma and we need to name it. For everyone in the world, not just North America, but in the world to study the pace at which black women are receiving degrees, not just undergraduate degrees, mm -hmm. master's degrees, PhDs, and still the fourth of, of, of all women, the least paid, then how is education the great equalizer? Therein lies a lie. Because racism, racism is not about ethnicity, it's about economics. And that's a conversation nobody really wants to have. Right. And so the other conversation that is sort of being had maybe is around secession. Right. Yes. There, there's a pay gap that exists along the journey, but then there's a matriculation of women who are brilliant 
and leading in all sectors that are not ascending into the top roles of CEO or board chairs. And I think what, what I would recommend, number one, all facts, all true. There are a lot of programs that are announced to move women of color into board chair, paid board chair um, experiences. What I will also say is that we have to find ways, if it's possible, to make the investment up the stories of these dynamic women. It is literally a brand strategy. No one knows what they do not know. They can't find you. They don't know you, right? And there's also this risk. So we have this relationship with amplifying the story of these women so that other young women that look like you or don't look like you, who identify with the essence of you and your story, they don't know how to find you. And then you have boards that don't know your contribution because the storytelling, the transmedia and the traditional branding and storytelling work is falling on the women themselves for it to be an investment they make in themselves. And in other areas, that's not true. It is negotiated into leadership agreements. It may be talked about as coaching and okay, that's fine if it's talked about as coaching, but then it's incumbent upon those of us in the coaching world or the, the people in the coaching world to say, okay, then what are the clear deliverables that come out of that? Mm -hmm. Is the narrative arc of the success of this woman being told truthfully? Do we know her story? So that the young woman who is Hispanic American or Asian American or Native American or African American finds themselves in your story. So they find possibility in your personhood. Now, if I read your executive bio and all I hear is, you know, every success, CEO of this, 17 degrees, eight, you know, PhDs and all of those things and served on 18 boards, all of which are phenomenal, don't get me wrong, but something informed that drive. And that's what the next generation needs to know. What informed that demonstration of yourself? Mm -hmm. And that is what the bio should talk about. It should talk about how you first learned. I'm not surprised when I listen to your story or Toya's story, how you learned about a giving circle around the kitchen table of your parents' home. So you literally were in, you were manifesting a giving circle in your youth. So it wasn't surprising when you began to get opportunities professionally and you were seeking solutions and you were seeking to find ways to solve problems. Your, your natural ilk said, I've been here before because you were immersed in it. <laughs> and, and the community has the solution. I just have to set the table right. and I have to invite community to this table and let's cook up the solution. And when they feel a part of that solution, they will go out and advocate for that solution. And I think that's what the bio does it when we do it well, when we do it well, but I, but I do think that there's an opportunity to integrate storytelling into the success of leadership and not just the recipient of solutions. I have thought more about the narrative of my leadership in community with you and Toya in the community of black women that I have been so honored to be in relationship with. And it, it has allowed me to see how many women, um, specifically in this conversation, in philanthropy that are navigating this space, number one, alone. Yes. Number two, identifying with measures of success that aren't 
innate to who we are and what feels right. So there's a rub there Mm -hmm. and really searching for, I think, a groundedness. And so what, like in all the things that we're talking about in terms of really actualizing the purpose, the essence, the generational lessons, the sense of community, what from your point of view has and is the value of having a, a, a community of black women around you? Trillion dollar transformation. Say more because I need trillion dollars in my life. <laughs> trillion dollar transformation. Okay. And I mean that with intentionality. And here, here's what I will say. That's the that's the stretch goal, like trillions, right? That's the stretch goal, like transformation. Iron sharpens iron. I'm I'm a, I'm a pull a page out of my great grandmother's book. She would say to me, Tashan, iron sharpens iron, water, rust iron. <laughs> So ensure that you are around people, women, who make you better. Iron, that they sharpen you. I think what I've experienced in and privileged to experience in the company of, of you and, and Toya and the other women in the cohort is that when I reflect on it, that um Struggle is not hard for women of color. We stretch, we sacrifice. Success is hard. (laughs) And when we put that on the table and when we say, okay, what does success look like for you? Because success is not a what I call a mustard or a mayonnaise experience like you it's just spread across for everybody it's unique to you it's customized for you so in the company of women in a sacred and safe space you get the privilege to create that for yourself you get to say conversations with Shonda like you're close to a hundred thousand dollars in the community. It's like, how do we get to a million? Yeah. Right. In the community of women, it's I'm close to a hundred thousand downloads, which is a powerful number in the ecosystem of the podcast world, which generates revenue in other podcasts. How does this cohort of women help me get to a million? That's the power of iron sharpening iron I call trillion dollar transformation. Because when you get to a million downloads, if not before then, you have now opened yourself up to an advertising world that creates revenue for this podcast, right? Not only do you have partners like Voice Vision Value, you have consumer product goods who are seeking to reach women of color with their products across every vertical of business globally, not just in America, because podcasts are a global phenomenon. So the internet did help us in that it collapsed these boundaries or barriers to entry for us to dream and then express. But what has been happening is that we haven't necessarily have the space and the sacred space to say, hey, sis, I want to get to a million downloads. Because I know if I get to a million downloads, some of the things I'm dealing with on a day-to-day in environments that are not as safe and sacred, I can forgo that without consequence to my family. I remove the risk. So let me ask this because, you know, and maybe, maybe I will personalize a little bit because I think that part of how I raised too was, I don't know if it is within humility, but I think that there is a hesitancy to ask, right? Because you, sometimes it's difficult to identify what it is that you need to ask for, 
there's a challenge in even creating a vision and saying it out loud for fear of, of not reaching that star. But in, in the community of women, I watched us sort of struggle, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you could feel the brilliance. You could see it like we wear it on our chest, right? Like mm -hmm. we wear it our very essence. But when you started digging into those questions, you watched us pull back. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. pulled back into safety. Mm -hmm. So in this community, at this time, across the globe, where we have women, Black women in philanthropy listening and having these needs to be in community. Like, what do we need to do to ask and to identify and feel safe with what we, like, what we need? Yes, I think if we explore that particular experience that I was in with you all in partnership, um, the energy, okay, so, all of the philanthropic audience and all of conversations with Shonda, I'm about to tell you something, okay? <laughs> this energy was so incredibly palatable. You could touch it, you could feel it. And I'm gonna go a step further. It wasn't just possibility, it was probability. It wasn't just possibility. And it was one of the few times in my life experience that I've ever felt that. And when I felt it, I also felt the hesitancy because when probability shows up, not just possibility and potential, as beautiful as they are, probability to get it done, when that showed up, the problem showed up. <laughs> and that's when I started listening. I tuned all the way in, like, wait a minute. And what I discovered in that was this beautiful love of family for the Rista family. That made me wonder, are the conversations of probability and dreaming and purpose happening with those you love before they're happening with those in community? Because when you have that kind of support, you feel differently about sharing with a community of sisters. And let me, let me make that even more plain. I don't know that we do the work to say, if I fully lived into my purpose, which are family, family, family business are born this way. What would a family business look like? If I fully lived into my business and my purpose, and these are our quantifiable expenses, how do we land in so that I'm able to stand and do it? Mm -hmm. And everybody has a connection to that conversation. And when you have that conversation, other conversations are easier to have because you get to stratify how you implement. One thing does not have to do it all. One community does not have to lift up everything. When you think in terms of your community, I have voice vision value. I have a cohort of women in leadership, right? So let's say you have seven of them and you have a vision that you know you're born to live and you have seven or eight different goals of experience. And I'm saying this to you this way, Shonda, because I know that's how you look at the constituencies in which you serve. You don't look at them monolithically. You stratify it. And you go, what does this community need? What does, what's the solution to this ill? What's the solution to that ill? So if you would do the same around the constituency or the community you have available to you, it actually deconstructs the, the weight of your destiny. It deconstructs it. It feels lighter. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. <laughs> yes, it all makes sense. And I, you know, it's it's funny because I, you know, in this conversation, I, I distinctly remember a moment where we were having a conversation around the vision, right? Which ultimately comes from the value where I see my own mm -hmm. value, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what what I remember, this is not what you said to me, but this is how I remember feeling. 
What I remember feeling is that what I said to you wasn't big enough. Mm -hmm. That what you observed in the time that you had spent with me was bigger than how I was communicating to you about me and my own possibility. Mm -hmm. And it was a profound moment. And I think that it came from a number of places including some of the things that we've talked about, the weight of responsibility, the weight of the moment, the safety of the moment, the, the maybe even the lack of, of real intentionality of those moments, having people be invested in those dreams to like, you know, make that muscle bigger over time, right? Mm -hmm. So I just, mm -hmm. I just remember, I've described it to people that way. Like I came in, I came in that little room and you were like, yes, <laughs> let's go back. <laughs> <laughs> go back and try again <laughs> and I'm gonna say this because this is something that women in general experience and then particularly women of color explicitly experience we do not get the permission to bet on ourselves <laughs> yeah we don't we we almost wait for the permission to bet on ourselves we're not necessarily given the permission on ourselves and our existence is sacrificial. When you think quickly, you yield your body for the birth of another. You give up yourself. Your food habits change, your nerves change, everything changes for you to birth another. So in different conversations and contexts, ask women, what would be the cost of birth? Would you be willing to birth yourself? That's oh. the conversation I have with them. I know you can do it for others. I see your children. I see love. I see successful corporations. I see successful teams. I see team members that have gone on to do dynamic things and can't stop talking about you. My question is, what would you be willing to do to birth yourself? I don't even know what to ask after that, other than I don't think I've ever heard it quite that way. But it has, it, what it brings up for me though, Tashan, is different stages of life, right? Yes. The birthing of, or the renewals that happen yes. in our journeys, right? That is- I love that. It's birthing, but it, it's not in the same sense in the way that I'm hearing it. It's not. Yeah. Once. It's not. I, lo I love your introduction and I'm going to say it and adopt it about renewal because I, I've often said, I remember my mother will say to you that I was like this kind of strange philosophical kid. And I would say, if a cat can have nine lives, why can't I? And she said, what? I'm like, well, why would you have to be one? Because oftentimes, that's how we are conditioned. We're socialized, spiritualized into this one thing, this one dimension. But that's not literally how destiny unfolds. It's many dimensions. And I often think about Rihanna and I'm like, okay, I know what her entry point was, but look at her evolution. Look at her expansion. Look at how and she's not that I'm just speaking in terms of someone we could talk about right now that's quick, but I have a notebook of people the same way. Man, you know, today I posted this video where Shikari Richardson, the track star, who yes. got all right. Yes. yes. 2021, she did an interview. She had just lost her mother. And um, she's teary in her interview and she looks sad and, and broken. And there, there's a video that contrasts her to today, right? To, you know, 2023. And she said, I did the interview before I was ready. But today I stand for, you know, in front of you, the same person that interviewed you, you know, me before, and I'm ready. And I'm not just back, I'm better. I'm not back, I'm yes. better. Right. Right. And I posted it because... There's a lot of women that get stuck at broken and think that that's what defines the rest of, of their journey. 
mm-hmm. right? Or there's elements of broken that stay mm-hmm. in their psyche, mm-hmm. right? That hold hold us back, mm-hmm. right? And so this idea of the rebirthing of what's possible in, in our potential and, and allow us to be ourselves even more at mm-hmm. and these inflection points in our lives, I think was really powerful to think about it that way. Absolutely. I think when we think of, when you think of the birthing process as a woman through the lens of, okay, let's take the the narrative of brokenness, right? But you connect it to what it means to birth. And I'm not saying it's just a child. I'm saying it's a career. (laughs) I'm saying you are a young woman or a woman and you have an initiative and you have you have to be in this initiative all those C-suite. You have birthed that. And when you think in terms of how you had to overcome hurdles within your own voices that are in the moment than what you actually felt to make choices that were more fact-based than feelings-based, right? So let's say as a mom and you, you're you carrying a child, you may, all of a sudden you liked applesauce. You ate applesauce every day of your life. And now that you're having a child, you can't stand applesauce. I mean, you literally, there's no human reason why you shouldn't be able to eat applesauce. You've loved it since the day your mother gave it to you at 12 months to the day someone told you you're having a child. But the reconstruction, how You have to be willing to reconstruct how you show up in the birthing process of yourself. Mm. What may have worked when you were 20 doesn't work at 30. It doesn't work at 50. It won't work at 60. Not because of anything other than you live, you are a creative being having a creative experience and expression in a physical world. Now that's not gonna always fly with people. Some some of your readers or listeners may go, okay, here she go. She's going, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, <laughs> but the real truth is you are having a creative expression, creative experience in a finite physical world. That does not mean that the physical world is the definition of your destiny. It means that your destiny is is actually meant to integrate a defined world, to disrupt a defined world. That's where innovation comes from. An antiquated system, an antiquated structure no longer works. And who's willing to bet on themselves and to bet on this disruption, to bet on this dissonance, to bet on this disconnection to say, consider some different. Right. So when I think about voice, vision, value. Oh, my word. Yes. You all, are, let me say something. Let me say something. And I want to be crystal clear. The women that voice, vision, value is cultivating and galvanizing The women who are connected to voice, vision, value have this powerful and beautiful experience through relationship with voice, vision, value and the women it is cultivating and galvanizing because they are in need of a very palatable way of being who they're born to be. Yeah. You you all are dynamic at teaching how you do it. Yeah. The opportunity is to share how you be it. Yeah. And yeah. in the being, I don't know how to say this other than nothing can stop who you're born to be. You know what I love the most about it? I have been in a lot of rooms and a lot of places over my journey where people women, sometimes Black women, have had a hard time sharing space. Yes. What I have learned even more 
is that in the sharing of the space, it just gets expanded. Absolutely. There is, you're right, because if you believe everyone has a purpose, then there's no tripping over each other. It's not even possible. I mean, it's not even possible. I mean, the maple tree doesn't compete with the oak tree. It's not yeah. real. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, if you think in terms of purpose, it is no distinction between what how God created everything or the God of your understanding, whatever you call it. Pluto doesn't compete with Mars. It just, it just doesn't. It's in collaboration. It is in coexistence, right? And I think that one of the opportunities that I've been privileged to have in this work is that I walk into the room and I recalibrate and I sage the spirit of lack and limitation because that came from trauma, if we're honest. That right. came from trauma, right? Mm -hmm. So when we sage and we say there is no lack, there's no limitation, I am born to be who I'm born to be and I'm not in competition. Like the rose doesn't compete with the tulip. The tulip is the tulip. <laughs> the rose is the rose, mm -hmm. right? The, the violet is the violet. Nature, we are oftentimes when there is lack of limitation, there's a competition with nature because nurture is trying to put a strong on nature. But who you were uniquely born to be, all of the space you, you come into with other women, the collaborative economy says every gift shows up. And if I could be spiritual for a minute, because you, know, you can cut it out or not, I often say to people, Christ didn't need 12 disciples to be God. He needed it to go further, faster, farther. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That was community to go further, faster, farther. So any of the women in the cohort come into a sacred space and say, my dream is to be a CEO of a nonprofit or my dream is to be the CEO of a global nonprofit. My dream is to be. Then every woman in this cohort asks the question, how do we support her? to go further, farther, faster. Yeah. You know, I just read this book, Jesus CEO. Oh, I, whoo. <laughs> love that book. I know I did. I love that book. And it was, I had these moments where I'm like, Jesus and his staff, right? Like the way that it gets framed. And I was like, this is so interesting. But the, the, the lessons in that book were very much the same way, right? that again, everyone has a purpose and a role. And that even, even with his team, yes, there were times that he was in that mountain by himself. By himself. Right? Except, fully accepting the cause, the cost, and the weight of purpose. That's right. Right. I just think these women, the women I've had the privilege to meet with Voice, Vision, Value, the ancestral narrative, the women you've come from, that's one of the highlights of the branding and the transmedia work that I'm privileged to do with you all is I start asking questions about, tell me about your mother and your grandmother and your great grandmother. I see you talk about the women you come from. I see you talk about how they were changing the world without a PhD, without an MBA, you know what I mean? Without a bachelor's degree. I see you telling me they knew how to bake a cake and get flour from the house 10 streets down the road. You know what I mean? Like this is genius. You're born of genius. And the genius is running through your veins. And what has happened is, We've let these societal norms compress that genius and become fearful of that genius. And I think about how, how do we have more but less? Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, have, we have more but less because we're committed to doing and not being. Mm -hmm. 
If we get to the business of being, we're going to start solving some, some problems again. Yeah. For women that are trying or looking or searching for their own voice, what advice would you offer? I would recommend that um, a woman in that space would invite her sacred self to show up. Invite your sacred self to show up. And she's very different than just your successful self. And how do you, how, what's the process of that? Okay, so I would recommend this. I recommend not just sitting still, I recommend removing yourself from your constant environment. Go on a staycation. I don't care if it's in the same city. I don't care if the, the hotel, go to uh, one of the hotel rooms, maybe less expensive, something affordable, and sit there with yourself and, and listen, make room to hear the very beat of your heart the very sound of your soul, the very whisper of your spirit, and it will speak to you. Mm -hmm. it, it, it may say, do one thing, just one thing, right? Successful women, and I'm just going to tell you this, all women are successful women. You're raising these children <laughs> and you loving your families, you're successful women. We just take on a lot. I remember having a client and I coached to do one thing. I said, clean out one drawer in your desk. She said, oh, no, 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 no. You don't see my desk. I said, yes, I do. I, I completely see your desk. Do one thing. Clean out, clean out that drawer. Because what that commitment does is clear up space for other dimensions of creativity. But when it seems too daunting, then destiny is hijacked. Hmm. And you're personally and professionally paralyzed. There's no movement. It's not always about doing everything. Do one thing, whatever that one thing is. Would you say it's the same thing for those that that have a vision of what they would like to do, but perhaps they, they're delaying it? Oh, absolutely. Do one thing. So write the vision. I don't know how many people are really courageous enough, Shonda, to say, I want a multi-million dollar podcast. Well, I'm getting there. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But like, I, don't, I don't know how many people... I want the, the courage it takes to dream. I think we, we make that like light. Yeah. But the courage it takes to dream and then to, to declare that dream, to put words to that dream, then demonstrate that dream through behavior and actions. Mm -hmm. like, what does it mean to want 1 million downloads or write it down? I want... 100,000 downloads, I want 250 downloads, I want 500,000 downloads, I want a million downloads, I want to be, I want to win awards for the, the best podcast in the ecosystem, I want, a, I want a six and seven figure revenue stream in the podcast ecosystem, I want, like, I'm talking to you and I'm looking at you, you're like, yeah, but, you know what I'm trying to say, but to dream, I'm, saying, I'm looking at you and I'm looking in my office and I'm like, the, like it, if it's in my head, it's not enough is what I was thinking. Yes, it's right? gotta be. So I'm literally write it looking down. around, like I'm looking at a wall. Come on, Shonda, come on, Shonda. That's and I'm it. I'm about to put it on the wall. This is, put it on the wall. That's the name <laughs> of the This is the name, the name of the name show. Of... I'm, yep, yeah. put it on the wall. <laughs> put it on the wall. Put it on the wall. Because, and, and, you know, as much as I have said voice, vision, value a thousand times, 2,000 times, 3,000 times, right? But like walking it through like this with you, right? Because I can't put it on the wall if I don't believe in my own value. Come on. You can't voice it. You can't vision it. 
if I do not believe in my own value, I can't, if I can't put it on the wall, I can't walk it, I can't work it, I can't realize it. And you, no one's gonna believe it. No, no one. Believe it. Yeah. Because I don't even believe in myself because I won't put it on the wall. I won't bet on myself. I won't, I won't tap into, I'm clear about I got gifts, God made me who God made me to be. Again, the God of my understanding, whatever you call it, spirit, otherness, whatever the word is, I'm not caught up on that. But you know, uniquely, there are gifts I have. I've seen them demonstrated. Why won't I put them on the wall? Because if I don't put them on the wall, I cannot put words to it. I cannot, what I call, I can't word it out. I can't walk it out. I can't live it out, and therefore I can't wealth it out. If you don't put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I mean, you are some bad women. I'm telling you, beautiful, brilliant, brave. I'm, I'm saying I've had the privilege to work with a lot of iconic talent, people that we know are celebrities. And I'm telling you, the same energetic vibration is in that room. We show up in different platforms. Don't get the stages confused. <laughs> yeah. I think it's so incredibly important to be affirmed in that way. And I know that the people listening have witnessed this in their own lives. And they've also witnessed the, the hesitation that goes along with that brilliance, right? Because it was so beautiful to be in the space and it was so clear when I could see it being mirrored back at me through the other sisters that I was connected to, that the weight of the responsibility in which we have been wearing was wearing on us, mm -hmm. right? And that it was in that community that I came back feeling renewed and refreshed and reflective and focused on what's ahead, not what was behind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the value of being intentional about being in community and being an intentional about what you're going to bring into it, what you're going to give into it, how you're going to be in, in it. You know, one thing I'll say, and I have had the privilege, I think we shared this in our cohort. There's a day that your calling will come calling beyond your career. Mm -hmm. Your calling will permit your career. There's a day when your calling will come calling. Let me share this with you. I didn't know if I was going to say it on this or not. So the day that I decided to announce that I was making a transition from where I was to where I was going, um, I made a post about it. So Toya Nash Randall calls me up and she said, do you realize a year ago on this day, we were in Atlanta? Mm, I did. I didn't. And I she did. said, we were in Atlanta. And let me read you what you said. I didn't remember some of what I said. I didn't remember that it was the exact date a year before that I had made a declaration on the same day that I had a different declaration on what was possible and what I wanted to do in my life. Mm -hmm. Because I remember being in that space with you in Atlanta. I will never forget this. You said to Sean, I have a podcast. I said, you have a what? <laughs> I probably you said, just like that too. You said, I have a podcast. I said, let me see it. That's what I said. You mean to tell me <laughs> you have cultivated conversations with all of these world leaders, iconic commentators, and I remember the look you were like, but like, but yeah, these are good people, and because they're good people, I reached out to them for good purpose. I'm like, um, uh, yeah, but let's talk about you drew them to yourself they connected with you mm -hmm. so what are we gonna do with this Ooh. I was like, oh. 
Yeah, so for the listeners, the part where I told you she told me to go back into the room and come back, this this the part. <laughs> it was beautiful. I wish people, I mean, it's powerful. And I will say this, go back, every listener, I encourage you. In fact, I implore you to binge listen to conversations with Sean. Binge listen. You can... Make a little room, turn Netflix off for a minute. I know you just like, you being Netflix and you being Chulu. Binge listen this podcast. One of the most profound, prolific, creative experiences because I did it. I did it. Thank and you. after our conversation, when I, I just had the context. And then after our conversation, I went back and binge listened. And I was like, wait a minute. And I think this is an important moment because I knew I was doing it and I was proud of it, but something was holding me back in the way that I seen it. And I think this is what is beautiful about sisterhood, about the declaration. And manifestation. Manifestation, right? Because as I've declared, okay, I'm going to take it. I'm going to evolve it. I'm going to rebrand it. I'm going to think bigger about it. And Toya's like, yo, I'm passing the baton to you because I've been doing these conversations, but sis. Come on now. You opened up the space. I opened up the space. She's like, sis, here, you take it. You take the next leg. Whoa. When we choose to embrace and sit with it a minute, this took you a year. It wasn't one minute oatmeal, right? But in the process of a year, you lived with it. You grappled with it. You meditated on it. You you journaled about it. You felt it. You looked at it. You extrapolated. You examined. You, you know, exegeted. You did all of those things. And then when the exit came, because it was right and true for you, what had been happening all along the line is purpose had went ahead of you and pursued a path that was already present for you. And you said, all right, and this is why we're here. That's it. And and, you know, one of the the best messages I got following that is from a woman here that I deeply admire. And she said, I am so happy you have chosen to bet on yourself. Now, you know, I didn't know that coming into this fall. I know. Ah! <laughs> Put it on the wall and bet on yourself. Bet on yourself. And I'm like, it's a big old leap of faith, but, it, but I believe in what but, will show up. Well, let me say this to you as, as a birthing being. And I'm saying birthing, not as just a body, as a yes. physical human. I'm saying birthing businesses, birthing initiatives, birthing teams, birthing in corporations. I want to say this to you. When you do that, right? You give the universe permission to come alongside of you and help. It has been one of the greatest gifts because what you are saying is what I'm experiencing now, Mm -hmm. right? women that have showed up next to me and said, how can I help? This is what I can do. Women who have said, I just don't know if I have the courage to make the move, but watching you made me do this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think that's the beauty of what this all is because we never know who, who we are inspiring, a room that we are creating right? We just don't know. All we have to do is just be. Oh my gosh. I'm going to tell you, um, and I was grappling with sharing this, but I'm, I feel it. You can edit it or not. I'm fine either way. But I came out of that room in Atlanta with your profound brilliance. And I wrote a book in three months. It so choked me up. It took a hold of me in my own purpose. And the book is called Coming in Hot a blueprint for black women setting the world ablaze. And the book is really about betting on yourself, but how you do it in tears 
phases that are that you could practically apply. And it's it's what I wished someone would have told me. And I know it's what you wish someone would have told you. No doubt. <laughs> because I first started from the mindset of a bit, I was sending to the world as education is a great equalizer. Okay, I have a PhD. That didn't equalize the corporate space for me. I have an MBA. That didn't equalize the corporate space for me. I still was paid less than the person I'm reporting to. And that person didn't have the degrees I had, right? And I had great relationships. They were proven, but the relationships did not translate to revenue. So now I'm caught in what I call the golden, golden cubicle. Mm. <laughs> so you go get more degrees, but you don't get the, the promotion. So now you got debt with the degree but no generational wealth. I just started prior to coming into being invited into this experience with voice, vision, value about branding, transmedia strategy, storytelling. I was doing that work on my own experience. Hmm. I was unthreading the needle. I was taking the knitting apart, but I was looking at the cultural context, honestly, Chandra. Like, what was the cultural narrative that I inherited, even with the best intentions, right? That placed me in this space that I could build for others, but not bet on myself. And then I start unpacking that and unraveling that and recreating that, just like you. One million downloads. One loading. I just have to say to all of those listening, I hope that this has inspired you as much as it has me. This this life is nothing but a journey down a path of our own purpose and, and doing it the best that we can be. And, you know, doing that in community has opened up so much that I was sort of raised like, you know, here's another one. You go to school to learn, not to make friends, right? Like you, you, you know, not to be talking mm-hmm. and doing all this kind of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So you you sort of forge this path of like this <laughs> crazy lonesome situation. And so, right. you know, I'm like, wait a minute, the more I'm like, hey, I need this. I need you, sis, in my life because I learn from you as I give to you. Yeah. Right. And it's not like I don't have that in my essence, but as I like I have done it more confidently, Mm -hmm. it is just so fruitful. And so I think that the invitation here and, and what is being created in this community, what is voice, vision, value? Yes. Documenting the stories of Black women leading in philanthropy is number one. We need to document our story. Yes, yes. Right? We we don't just exist. We have legacy and, and our legacy stories have to be told. Yes. And we have to encourage the whole story to be told. And we only do that when others observe and, and share what they see so that we can see ourselves more completely. And so thank yes. you for being that mirror and that that Thank that you. person that has stretched me beyond <laughs> what I knew I needed stretching when I when I've encountered you. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's an honor. I'm humbled. I'm honored to be in the same room, the same light with you. I um your success is what I pray for, what I dream for. And I promise you, I want to be in the pit seats celebrating you. I don't want to be in the balcony. I want a <laughs> real seat down in the orchestra. You know? Yeah. I want to be in the mosh pit of your manifestation. How about that? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I appreciate you. Thank you so yes. much. Sister, Thank you. On centering conversations and exclusive conversations with Shonda Conversation powered by Voice Vision Value Black Women Leading in Philanthropy. If you want to know more about Voice Vision Value, check us out at voicevisionvalue.org, where you can also read 
the Twin Cities chapter of the forthcoming book, Portraits of Us.